the global electric circuit has been known, you know, uh, since even before the time of Benjamin Franklin did his experiments on thunderstorms and also in fair weather. You can fly a kite in fair weather and it'll uh, cause um, electric discharge if, if you have a conductor coming down from the kite. Part review, part criticism, part correction, part progress, and part outlook. We're about to be caught up on the science and societal posturing as we enter the new era of solar forcing climatology. When you realize that you have to go down over 600 feet into the oceans before the sunlight can reach the depths no more, and that all that light is directly transformed into heat, it isn't necessarily difficult to see how that heat can be lost for years in the ocean depths, or how extra particle driven forcing might be able to do the same. But wrapping your head around the million year near carbon dioxide starvation of plants and that greenhouses keep levels at least three times higher than in the ambient atmosphere today, the complexity of the concepts accelerate. So, we learn to lean on foundations that are easier to construct, ones that demonstrate critical flaws in climate models, the true variability of our star's energetic deliveries to Earth, and the perspective on plant food measured in parts per million. Even in the lower variability aspects, like the multi-percent spikes in neutron counts during major solar outbursts, which can still be a hundred times or more variability than the solar irradiance at 0.1%. There are many problems in the models that have caused the UN to change the game looking forward to 2022 and beyond. And indeed, in the meantime, the anthropogenic blaming crowd is holding on for dear life. The sad thing is that this is a reputable academic website, and these are not climate scientists, but a space scientist and a physicist, and both should know better than to use sunspot data in these comparisons to temperature data, which is going to confound and further trick their readers of, again, this reputable academic website. Now, since these authors decided to be lazy and pandering, and since their fields demand better diligence of them, I've decided to use them to demonstrate how you can easily debunk articles like this until the larger story begins to change. And considering the slow crawl of academia, that could be a while, and so you'll need this skill. The core description accompanying those charts, which we'll see again in a moment, is this, and their first paragraph is utterly accurate. Cycle 24 was one of the stepping stones down towards the grand solar minimum expected this century. But in the next paragraph, they make their first move of what is hopefully honest ignorance. Their application of a direct time frame forcing to the sun is not at all accurate and does not apply any of the accepted lag periods that we have shown and discussed, let alone the longer one proposed by Dr. Roger Higgs. They also select a paper and use it as an example, as though one paper on the topic was ever submitted in the past. Try hundreds, and you could ask me to find just about any range of prediction within reason on a planet such as Earth, and I will find you a scientist that published it. It's just that simple. Now, their last line here is a beautiful piece of irony that will inevitably reveal their failure. The hottest decade on record indeed, which only goes back to the 1800s in the mind of climate scientists, by the way, comes right at the end of the grand solar maximum of the Holocene. The last time the sun produced like this was the end of the last ice age and the start of the modern era. But on shorter time scales, the reliance on sunspots betrays them, as it does not at all paint a true picture of solar forcing. While sunspots, and indeed solar radio flux, peaked in the middle of the 1900s, we just recently reviewed that CME production, by measure of cosmic ray reduction, peaked around 1992, and did remain at high levels, with low cosmic rays through about 2004, one of the reasons we say that the modern grand solar maximum ended around 2005, when the sunspots ended in that cycle. If you haven't seen some of the new data sets that the UN is going to be letting in for the sun, I have cropped just some of the key forcing factors here, and we see that the UV wavelength in the long wave, top panel, it does match the 11-year up and down of the sunspot cycle, but not the sunspot peak in the 50s. There was a high peak that occurred in 1960, but then the real peak was the three high cycles in a row in the 80s, 90s, and ending around 2004 or 2005. 
in the middle panel, we have geomagnetic activity, which excites dynamics and is related to joule heating. And while sunspot cycles tend to push the dial to the max across the board, take a look at the gap from the 1950s to about 2005 along the bottom the white, where the geomagnetic index never reached those lower levels as before. The peak of sunspots was merely the beginning of that geomagnetic maximum that would last 50 years. Finally, the high-energy protons at the bottom show how the solar flare energetic particle radiation was most prevalent in the early 2000s, half a century after the peak in sunspot activity. And so we not only have a failure to accurately identify the trends of solar forcing by a physics professor and a space science PhD, but they neglected basic solar forcing lag times that not even the staunchest global warming thumpers deny amidst the literature. These are two critical failures by the authors of that article. Not even to mention that when in the year 2000, NASA said we'd lost 10% of Earth's magnetic field in the last century or so, it didn't make it into climate models, and neither did the increased vulnerability of Earth when the ESA Swarm mission updated that to 15% in 2010, a number that is yet to be revised again in public reports. So, no, the sun's activity should never be measured with sunspots, and that is going away in upcoming climate models because the officials have realized the failure and that after 40 years the solar physicists' voices had to be heard. Sadly for the rest of us, interdisciplinary diligence to a renaissance level is utterly absent in modern academia. And while some of the changes moving forward can be expected, others come out of the blue, like the recent focus on the floor of the ionospheric layers, the ozone, at the Arctic region. This layer just got vastly more important to discussions due to a recent work in Nature describing how ozone-destroying chemicals have resulted in half of the Arctic warming, which, by the way, is one-third of all global warming across the planet since the 1800s, and that takes the extreme focus on that plant food down yet another peg. But in addition to rewriting where they're pointing the fingers for climate change, this forcing pathway opens them up to even more influence to be discovered by the sun. The polar region is where the day-to-day -day solar forcing comes most into play, in addition to taking considerable particle forcing and electric induction during those extreme storm events that we've already seen. The solar particle forcing is very strong at the polar region, where, for six months out of the year, there's basically no irradiance forcing at all due to Earth's tilt in the six-month night. Their opening the door to this protective layer failure forcing pathway is exceptional, given that the interplanetary magnetic field surges protons to the northern polar cusp long before the CME shockwave reaches our planet. Here are some of the relevant portions of Professor Emeritus Dr. Brian Tinsley's talk from our 2019 conference, starting with that polar region and then moving across the global atmosphere. So you'll recognize this diagram. Uh, again, it's a north-south section through the Earth and its magnetic field in the solar wind. The main magnetic field in the Parker spiral is actually east-west, in and out of the, the picture here. And we've got these uh, cusp regions where the Field lines from near the magnetic poles there, considered open field lines, they map out and they can merge in with the solar wind in complicated fashions here and here. And then because the solar wind or the, is moving relative to the Earth by three to 800 kilometers per second, the conducting field lines be between these two points are conductor moving in a magnetic field of the sort that you have in a normal generator where you have an armature moving in a magnetic field and that generates an electric field which drives a current. So what we have is a, what's called a Lorentz electric field, the, but it's perpendicular to both the motion and the magnetic field. So now we have a north-south electric field and uh, that can be hundreds or so of kilovolts between these two uh, ends of the conducting path. This is EZ, the, the, the Lorentz field. There's also um, uh, a dawn-dusk electric field due to the north-south magnetic field. So we have an east-west uh, electric field which drives these rural currents that produce what are, what's called the rural electrojet in addition to field line currents here. So there's a lot of complicated plasma physics going on there, but if you just measure the potential of the ionosphere above 
the, uh, in the region of the South Magnetic Pole and the North Magnetic Pole, you can fly a satellite through it and look at the potential difference with respect to the low latitude regions, as has been done many thousands of times. And we find that there's a dip in that, uh, well, there's a correlation, and if you put, look at the lag correlation after three days, the opacity has dropped significantly at 95% statistical significance uh, now for a couple of days, and then it starts to recover. Using as a reference three to five days before the maximum measured thunderstorm-generated global ionospheric potential change, we're measuring that at Vostok uh, in Antarctica. Then there was an increase from three to five days before to one day be uh, to two days before to one day before, maximized on the day of the maximum of the measured electric field and decreased afterwards. So that's a confirmation, if you like, um, uh, control on the solar wind input having that effect. Uh, we also, sometime before, back in 2008, had published data on the surface pressure in Antarctica changing as the interplanetary magnetic field BY component changed. We did it on the basis of measurements at stations in Antarctica and in the Arctic. Um, Mamie Lamb and colleagues did it in 2013 looking at a database of um, global meteorological data uh, called reanalysis data, and then we're able to look at pressure changes all the way from the South Pole here up to the North Pole, and they found that the pressures when, um, when the BY changed from negative to positive in the solar wind, and it changes as the Earth goes through these waves in the heliospheric current sheet that Joan talked about. And uh, there's a wavy structure, and you go from the southern um, hemisphere, if you like, of uh, outward magnetic field to the northern hemisphere of inward magnetic field. And those waves, um, you go from a positive um, BY to a negative BY, which is the, the current direction in the Parker spiral, um, something well, at least once in every solar rotation, where, so you have a 13-day periodicity, but you also have sometimes a, a, a four-sector structure and you have a, uh, just six days one and six days the other, and sometimes it's a bit different, again, if there's a more complicated structure of active regions around the sun. Anyway, uh, as you go from negative to positive, we found um, about 50 pascals, okay, 50 pascals increase in pressure over the Antarctic. There was a decrease in the middle latitudes, southern middle latitudes, because actually if you're increasing the pressure, air has to be flowing from somewhere to make that pressure change and it flows from the lower latitudes. With four bush decreases, which are decreases by 10, 20% uh, in the cosmic ray flux, or the big four bush decreases, Todd and Niverton way back in 2001 showed that the cloud cover decreases by tens of percent uh, in this region within the polar cap, which is where the lowest energy cosmic rays come in, which are most modulated by the solar wind. Uh, now, cloud cover changes were observed by Putovkin and Veritnenko here and with the Russian um, ozone observing network, and they found that cloud cover, or at least atmospheric transparency, decreased when you had four bush decreases, which is saying that there's an effect on atmospheric transparency, which could be high clouds, cirrus clouds, or aerosol particles that uh, changes as the currents change coming in during the forbish decrease. With my student, Matt Kirkland, we looked at how the solar wind speed actually varied as we went across the boundaries or magnetic sectors. Solar wind speed drops uh, in the low speed region here. And the relativistic electron flux measured out at geosynchronous orbit uh, also drops quite dramatically, actually, by uh, several tens of percent. And this measure of the storminess in the North Atlantic, uh, well, actually, this is a global measure of storm, storminess, and that dropped, too, um, in synchronism with the drop in relativistic electron flux. This is precisely what young Ferris Wall decided to focus on starting in 2016. He and his family had been following space weather and the solar forcing science, and Ferris had decided to do a science project on it. This is him at our 2017 conference in April. A few months later, he would win the New Mexico State Championship, then months later, the National Middle School Science Championship, and in 2018, 
he made the top 100 in the Google World Championships. The storm forcing, he revealed, using coronal hull streams on the sun is uncanny. And if you can notice the little lag time of a couple of years that exists between the bottom curves, the solar input, and the top curves, the tropical storm frequencies, then you have been able to notice how this 16-year-old just figured out what those PhDs in the field could not. Uh, this is a paper we published in 2013, but we have published another four or five papers since then uh, detailing this. But I want to show that here we have these dots, uh, various computer simulations of what happens to the collision rate coefficient, which you can see here is changing by orders of magnitude as we go up this vertical scale. And this is the size of the particles, so we go from a nanometer up to 10 microns. So we call this electro-anti-scavenging, which I think is occurring, occurring in these regions. So this is um, a summary, if you like, a flowchart of what's going on. On the day-to-day -day time scales, we see thunderstorms. This is our control. The thunderstorms change the global ionospheric potential, and we see changes in the Arctic and Antarctic clouds and the surface pressures. The solar wind drives polar ionospheric potential within the polar cap, and we see changes in clouds and, of course, in Jay-Z. Cosmic rays also affect Jay-Z and high-latitude winter cloud, the relativistic electrons. Solar protons, uh, there's clear correlations found with Jay-Z and, uh, and atmospheric vorticity there. The day-to-day -day solar wind forcing of the polar region, even outside of the extreme solar storm times, is certainly not some small, negligibly changing electrodynamic scenario. Apparently, half of Arctic forcing can account for a third of the world's overall climate change, and so even before the first study in the 2022 and beyond era is conceived, we've got numerous forcing correlations, mechanisms, and pathways for the forcing. We know some of the key model deficiencies and how the IPCC and major university professors are starting to see the writing on the wall and address those concerns. We've got the first steps to recognizing the breadth of solar forcing, even as the full particle influence remains elusive to the field at large. The future of solar forcing now looks as bright as the sun, and you are officially caught up on the last few years of climate science development that the news is conveniently forgetting to mention. Hopefully, that doesn't go for your professors as well. At the end of this examination, for now anyway, we remind everyone that we leave no quarter for pollution. This is the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the soil in which we grow our food. We can't poison it. But we also cannot confuse feeding it with poisoning it and we could not ignore the long-term implications of solar forcing of the terrestrial climate. More information is found below, including the entire series here, the full movie that came before, and whenever you're watching this, I'll see you in the morning for the daily update. Be safe, everyone.